everyone and a very warm welcome to another podcast of Clara and Conversation with me, Claire Ford. Today on the podcast, I'm chatting with Des Clark, stand-up comedian, impressionist, comedy actor, TV and radio presenter, podcaster, events host, after-dinner speaker, charity fundraiser and much more besides. Recently, he has been sharing with us on radio and television his fears and phobias and his often hilarious for us, the viewers and listeners, not for him, ways to overcome them. He even gets to present his own breakfast radio show in the mornings with a former Miss Scotland. Hello, Des, and welcome to Clara in Conversation. Oh, thank you, Claire. That is the best introduction that I've ever had at any point in my career. And it's good to hear it all listed in one place because I've been trying to figure out all these years what exactly is it I do. And... Uh, <laughs> And it, it turns out I do quite a lot. So thank you for that lovely warm intro. And it's a pleasure to be on with a proper podcaster in you. <laughs> thank you so much. And there is a lot of hype about this one, Des. And I know everybody at home is so excited about this podcast, as we are ourselves. And I hope you all enjoy it. As was seen from the introduction, Des, you've had a very wide and varied career in entertainment, but your fledgling career in comedy started at just 19 years old with open mic nights and doing stand-up comedy routines whilst you were still at university. You've spoken on several occasions over the years about how you were a very shy boy growing up. So what possessed you to go into the field of stand-up comedy, which has often been a graveyard for many aspiring comedians? I tell you, I don't know. I, I'm still questioning that decision to this day. I could have worked in a bank or been a regional manager of a supermarket, but I don't know what it was. I think it was, I always loved comedy. I was such a big fan of it growing up. I, my favourites for me, Billy Connolly was the best ever. Being from Glasgow, which I'm from, and doing what he did all over the world made such a success. But then how do you take being a fan to then doing it as your job? And I think that's the ultimate. When you can take your hobby and your passion and make it a career, then it's the best thing you can do. And for me, it probably happened at school, Holyrood Secondary School in the south side of Glasgow. A pal of mine um, encouraged me with him to do a double act at the school talent show. This was in first year. And I'd come from a very small primary school in the Gorbals. And to go on stage and do my thing in front of a lot of people, I was very, very shy I was more scared about embarrassing my sister, who was in fourth year. And she's like, please don't ruin my credibility here, Tess. This, <laughs> this, this could be the end of me, please. And uh, to be fair, she actually helped in the end with some of the script. I think she just wanted to make sure I got it right. And you're right, at that stage, it was just impressions of the teachers and whoever was famous in, I guess, the early to mid-90s. And I, it went it went well, surprisingly. So we won the talent show which was really rare for first years and for people doing comedy. It was just a little comedy skit that we did. And I think that's when the seed was sown. At that stage, I thought, wow, what a buzz I got from this. And it lodged in my mind that one day I'd maybe like to give it a go on a proper stage. And as you say, it was when I was 19, starting at Blackfriars Pub, the downstairs in the Merchant City in Glasgow. That was it. The open mic nights, then doing the Edinburgh Fringe and then everything came from there and that's how the journey began. Incredible and you're talking about the impressions there. Were these impressions delivered a la Bart Simpson who self-styled as the boy of a thousand voices and were your <laughs> teachers quite relaxed about you ripping out of them or did you receive any backlash like Bart of whom Principal Skinner remarked he's just become the boy of a thousand days of detention? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was I, w- I wish it was a thousand voices it was barely two or three and even at that I had to tell you who I was doing before I did it so that's when I knew okay maybe the comedy's alright I'm not sure about the impressions but I don't think the teachers did any backlash because we were doing well with the sketches they were getting laughs so it was actually making them popular and um, I remember, you know, we had a, a grey head teacher called Mr Moynihan, Finbar Moynihan was his name. And he would always uh, say, talk about wearing your school tie. And I remember just, it was this weird pronunciation of tie. And when you get something to hang on to, it gives you a voice. Um, so we then would mix in like, do, I mean, doing the Hedy. You're, you're, I'm 11, 12 years old and I'm doing an impression of the headmaster. Now, when I think about bravery and comedy, that's about the bravest thing I've ever done. Because the guy was in the room, 
and there was about 600 people watching us. <laughs> like, how was the gig? Yeah, it went well. I was expelled, but, you know, got a few <laughs>, laughs. Um, but the, the thing is, when we saw him laughing, when we saw the other teachers laughing, and obviously the pupils loved it, it was just a great feeling. And uh, they, they embraced it and, and everybody encouraged it. And it was such a big thing for overcoming the shyness and the insecurity that I always had. And maybe that's just working class background or I, I don't know. I can't explain it, but I always had that. And it took me a long time to get rid of that. That was the first hurdle on it. And then doing stand up and again, doing that for months and months and having the good gigs and having the bad gigs. And ultimately it helped me with my confidence on stage and with my confidence in life. So I've got a lot to thank comedy for. That's incredible. And you mentioned Billy Connolly. But what other influences inspired your comedy style, Des? Do you know what? It's a great question. And Connolly was one of the impressions that me and my pal used to do as well at the Skill Talent Show. Because we love Billy because he was always kind of throwing his hair back and saying things were brilliant. And it was all that kind of thing. And it was it was all very good, you know. And you'd kind of do that, that kind of younger Billy that was quite high. And then he sort of went that very mysterious kind of withering kind of way. Um, so that, again, that as a starting point, you know, when you have the accent and then you can kind of go into that world, it, it just hearing him tell those stories and going to see him live two and a half hours without a break and just this amazing, you know, uncompromising style of knowing who he was, having his own voice and telling stories about Scotland and Glasgow all across the world. Tell the same stories in Australia, America, Canada, didn't matter. Um, so that was that was certainly an influence. I always loved Robin Williams as mm. a kid as well. And then growing up as well as that, and just, just seeing the man's energy and the creativity. Mm. And I always loved him in, in films. So I think they were big influences. And then when I was coming through, there, were, there was a few really, really good comedians just when I was starting out that were already really well established. I remember guys like Ross Noble who were on the circuit fantastic Geordie comedian, still gig, still sells out every theatre across the country. The way the guy could improvise was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Tommy Tiernan was a guy that I remember watching at the Edinburgh Fringe at Late and Live when I was coming through. And I thought, wow, this, these people are phenomenal and they're doing what I do, but on another level. Um, and But yeah, I mean, I could talk all day about just great comedians. There's just fantastic comedians on the circuit that maybe people haven't heard of unless you go to live comedy. There's so much talent out there. It's great to see. And so much of it in Scotland as well. We're such a funny and creative place. And when you're on the bill alongside these people, it just forces you to be better at what you do. And you also, you're getting a free show because not only are you on, you're getting to watch three or four other fantastic comedians doing great work. And as I always say, it was a passion, it was a love that ended up becoming a job, and that's mm -hmm. the best way to describe it, and it was it was great for me. And it isn't work. If you enjoy something, it isn't work. That's the beauty of it. You're right, and... absolutely that way. Though some nights, it, it felt like work, because every <laughs> comedian, you know, no, nobody's perfect. Like anybody mm -hmm. has bad days at their job, and as a comedian, especially the first couple of years, you die on stage quite a lot. They call it that just because it feels like you're dying inside and you want to be anywhere else other than that place. Mm -hmm. But as bad as it feels at the time, you learn more from a really bad gig than I think you do from 10 good ones. So you just have to take it as as experience. It's You don't lose in life, you just learn. So everything's a learning and then ultimately makes you better, makes you a stronger person and hopefully better at what you do. Absolutely. And I've seen you perform in your stand-up routine several times over the years, Des, and I am always struck by how fast-moving your delivery is. Obviously, the faster you speak, the more material you have to write to be able to fill your allotted slot on the bill. But what was the reason behind your decision to go for such a fast-paced delivery in your routines? I think when I was younger, it was nervousness. It was insecurity. Uh, it was just trying to say it as fast as possible because I was still trying to remember it. It's like when you learn you learn stuff for an exam or a test, you just want to have a word vomit and get it all out there and be like, right, that's it, it's done. Uh, there was also part of me that was trying to nullify the threat of a heckler. There was also part of me that was trying to get the audience on side quickly and early. 
And it was a lot of just trying to use natural nervous energy. So mm. on stage, I think you're a turned up volume version of yourself. So that was how I was off stage. Certainly before I went on, people would talk about me walking up and down backstage if I had a fit bit on me at that time. I think I'd have done my steps just in the five minutes before I went on stage and burning a hole in the carpet just by being nervous and thinking about it. So a lot of it came from nerves about trying to deal with hecklers and about just hopefully trying to channel that into some something more positive. I have slowed down a lot from then, although I'm still quicker than most on stage. And uh, as you say, it means you've got to write a lot more material, but it feels like you're giving more value to the audience. And I don't know, maybe that's just the, the, the place that I come from, but I think if you can give them quality and quantity and have a high hit rate with the laughs and maybe that is the Robin Williams influence in me because he was always a very quick up-tempo comedian and Lee Evans another guy that I loved watching as a kid I think maybe that rubbed off on me and it just was a way to channel my natural energy and gave me a nice rhythm and I think rhythm's important I think Scots particularly Glaswegians are quick talkers so when you've got that rhythm naturally use it to your advantage so that's probably where that came from Absolutely. And stand-up comedy as a type of artistic expression can take on many different forms, Des. It has evolved over the years with observational comedy probably being the most popular style of stand-up comedy taking over from the joke-based style. Some comedians have characters, others sing humorous songs. Some comedians are like Jack D and are deadpan. Others interact with audiences, some like Ricky Gervais tell the audience that in no uncertain terms can they engage with him during his performances. <laughs> Some comedians are storytellers, others are topical, political, satirical, and so on and so forth. But what style of comedy do you favour, Des? And was this always the case? Or have you evolved and changed your comedy repertoire over the years? I think I've definitely evolved. I was really surreal when I started. I was a little bit more out there, very fast, as you say, much more so even than now. And it was almost like this wordplay stuff that I was doing. There was a lot of that in there because that's where I came from. And I probably didn't have as much life experience. So I couldn't tell stories. I couldn't do anecdotes. So my observations, I felt, hadn't really developed as well at that stage. Or certainly I wasn't as confident in them. Uh, I think generally probably I'd fall somewhere into the observational category. But I still try and tell rhythmical jokes as much as I can. I still try and hit punchlines. And I still try and do a bit of wordplay somewhere in my set, almost as a nod to where I started. Never forget what got you there. So I'd say that's probably where I fall into. And and whatever I do, whether it be comedy, radio, television, panel shows, whatever I end up doing, I always like to think that I, I've got a voice now so that that carries through into everything that I do. And you'll slightly change the style of delivery, depending if you're doing a live TV broadcast, if you're doing something with comedy or you're doing something a bit more serious or you're on a stage. But as long as it's me and, you know, somewhere along the journey, I've found my voice, whatever it is, I've got it now, I've got a style. And I think that probably is the key to it. So that in my own way that I'm unique and whenever you see me in something, you'll say, yeah, that's, that's Des, that's him. That's what he does. Absolutely. And you were famously given a slap by Ian Cranky Des for dissing his wee schoolboy <laughs> wife at an award ceremony. But <laughs> have you ever really been in a situation over the years where an audience had been outright hostile and unresponsive towards you? Oh, that was a very funny sketch, by the way. That was I'm sort of crying and <laughs> laughing about that. That was the uh, Queen of the New Year sketch show that went out mm -hmm. at Hogmanay the year before last, and they <laughs> did a parody of the Will Smith Chris Rock incident at the Oscars, and it was me presenting a show in Scotland, and the actor slapped me uh, across the face for <laughs> this and we Jeanette Cranky. Uh, and in many ways, I think that could have happened in real life. Uh, mm. but, uh, amazing moment and great to be part of that. It's never really happened that dramatically in in real life. Obviously, I've had very tough gigs like everyone has. What's worse for a comedian, I think, is not being heckled, it's being ignored. And when you're doing your set and people are talking amongst themselves and you can hear them thinking about what they're going to order for Tesco that night and what they're having for their dinner, 
that's when you know you've lost the crowd. At least if they're talking to you, they're still there and somebody's going to pay attention. And it's hard to know when you're coming through how to deal with heckles because I think half the time the audience don't realise what they're doing. They're either a bit drunk or they think they're helping out. So it's it's not happened as dramatically as that. I think I've I've been at gigs at the fringe, maybe late night gigs where stuff was being thrown on stage. Um and I've I've been at gigs where people have stormed the stage. And when you're young and inexperienced, you really have no idea what's going on there. So you just kind of keep talking. I remember being at Jonglers in I think it was Battersea, and uh I was I'd just come off. I remember it was a gig that I was booed on. So I thought this could be tough because the guy on before me was a Geordie and they didn't like him because he was from the north. And the compere said to them, well, if you didn't like that guy, you're going to hate this guy all the way from Scotland, please. And it's just started (laughs) booing me on. So I stumbled and stammered through the gig, but it turned out it wasn't any of us that night. There was just a bad atmosphere in the room and I'd just come off. And the next act came on, and within the first two minutes, a fight broke out uh, in the crowd. So it turned from comedy into UFC. And <laughs> thankfully, the comedian was brilliant, a guy called Ricky Grover, and he stayed on stage, commented in the fight, and commented on the whole situation, including the police being called, kept his set going, and got a standing ovation at the end. So it, it does happen, and we've mm-hmm. all been at those crazy gigs, and that... As I said at the start of this, it's part of the learning curve and it gives you a story to tell on brilliant podcasts like this. Definitely. But you come out the other end and that it shows that you obviously can cope with anything really. So as you say, yeah, it's a learning curve. I remember, it's happened to, I remember being in a student gig and having cereal thrown at me on stage. <laughs> and I, I didn't know why. I thought had somebody prepared to bring like Cocoa Pops to a gig and... <laughs> I found out later, it was Freshers Week, and I think they'd been given this starter pack of, here's what you need, students, breakfast cereal, because obviously you're all getting up really early and you're very hungry. And I was just the wrong guy, maybe people taking a lot of drink for the first time in their life. And yeah, I I mean, I probably shouldn't have tried to catch the Cocoa Pops in my mouth. But (laughs) again, again, there's being heckled and there's uh, there's catching uh, bits of stuff that can turn the milk chocolatey. But um, yeah, we, weird things happen, and that that's comedy. So mm-hmm. as we all say, you learn from it, and hopefully you move on a better comedian by the end of the gig. Definitely. And impressions can either be an exact carbon copy of a celebrity's voice, or they can be exaggerated for extra comedy value. I've often found myself laughing more heartily at impressions that are not technically accurate, but which exaggerate some quirk of a celeb. For example, Sir Alex Ferguson's speech impediment, Boris Johnson's mumbling, Donald Trump's repetition of key phrases, Nicola Sturgeon's overly pronounced Scottish accent, and the like. Some of your impressions, Des, are uncannily accurate and others are caricatures. But how and when do you decide how you're going to approach a new celebrity impression? Well, for me, it's it's never a conscious decision. And I very early on in my career, I realised that I wasn't a pinpoint accurate impressionist. Many of us stand-ups try and give a go at impressions to add something if we're doing a sketch or if we're doing a bit of stand-up. And, for example, one of my best friends in the world is Lewis McLeod, who is, mm. to me, one of the best impressionists on the planet He is weirdly accurate. He can speak for long monologues in the voice of almost anyone. He can watch a tape of someone and after two or three minutes of a YouTube clip, he's got them perfectly. And I've been lucky enough also to work with John Culshaw and Rory Bremner and many others that are unerringly accurate at all of these great voices. I think for myself and a few other stand-ups in the circuit, it's a case of if we can land it somewhere near then we're all right. And we're talking about landing it near. We're not going to get it at Glasgow Airport. If we can get it to Presswick, that's (laughs) near enough. Your voice can take a shuttle bus to where you're actually going to. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, little little quirks of Boris Johnson. I mean, I've not said a word there. Um, If if you just tuned in, you'd think I'm having some sort of convulsion. But yeah, yeah, you, you, clear. And then you, you just sort of, I don't know, something happens to your body. And then Donald, Donald Trump, what a guy, what a podcast. 
Claire, Clary Claire, a lot of good people, a lot of good. I love the Clarians. They're great. Claire, Julian Clary, he was a great guy. And you call, <laughs> said, we're going to build a wall, a beautiful wall, a Scottish wall, a big wall. The people of Carlisle are going to pay for it. And you, you just do these mad little riffs. And as long as people have a general idea, and I remember watching the great series of The Trip with Rob Brydon and Steve Coogan. They had this exact chat of Rob Brydon saying Coogan's impressions were more technically accurate, but Coogan then admitting that maybe the caricatures picking certain little quirks made the thing funnier. And that's that's probably where I fall in because, mm. again, in terms of, of accuracy, I don't think I can hit it like the other people do, but I don't rely on it. So now and again, when I can throw it in, as long as you vaguely know who I'm meant to be, then I, I think it, it probably works. And if it doesn't, then, oh, well, I'll just tell you a joke and it'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. And the innovative impressionist Mike Yarwood once said, I wanted to be a star impressionist and then become a comedian and develop my own personality. But that didn't happen because there isn't really a me. Mike's act was almost exclusively confined to doing impressions, whereas you Des, have a broader range of skills. But can you see that there is a danger for impressionists in having their own personalities been taken over by constantly mimicking and acting out the lives of other people? It does happen, yeah, I know impressionists and they have a struggle then to find their own voice and then to speak in their own voice and they often think, oh, I'm not as funny as me and people don't want me, they just want me to be the jukebox doing the impressions. So it is a difficult balance to get, but again, it's uh, it's almost a victim of their own success. So remember within that story, there's the word success. They're obviously extremely good and extremely talented at what they do, um, but they've then become so familiar with these lovely, comfortable slippers that they slip into, which are the voices that they do, that maybe it can be a struggle. And Yarwood was one of the best of all time. And obviously he had huge success in primetime television back in the day of doing all the top impressions. But then maybe there was that struggle to be mm. funny and be confident as himself. And sometimes in life it is easier to be other people. And even actors have spoken to me about what I do. So I admire an actor, the ability to get yourself into that character the headspace that takes is something phenomenal. And I've not done anything at a great level when it comes to acting. But then you'll get an actor that will appreciate the stand-up, the ability to go up there and be authentically yourself. And there's no hiding place with it. And when you find that voice as a stand-up and when you're confident and comfortable enough in your own skin, and boy, does it take a long time to get there and you take a lot of hits on the way. But if you can get to that point, it means that there's probably a lot more that you can do in the business, especially when it comes to broadcasting, because if you can be real and be in the moment as yourself, it, it just means that there's so much in terms of transferable skills that you can use elsewhere. And lucky enough, that's worked for me. Absolutely. And that's great that you appreciate that and you feel that way. And you were spotted and invited to audition to become the new breakfast radio show presenter at Beat 106, which is now Capital Scotland. But prior to this, you had no background in radio whatsoever. And at only 21 years old, Des, I can imagine that this would have been a daunting prospect for you. Did you go into this period of your life full of trepidation or were you just full of youthful exuberance and confidence? Nah, uh, option one, please. Uh, yeah, Claire, it was more still lack of confidence, uh, not believing that I was good enough to do this, not having any experience of having done it, being really nervous. And mm -hmm. people always talk about being headhunted and being the first choice for a gig. I think for that one, like some others, I was the last choice. I think they'd been through every demo of every radio presenter and they were looking for something different. Beat 106 was a slightly edgy radio station. Uh, played a little, you know, cool mix of, um, I would say, dance music, a bit of rock in there. They tried to stay away from more of the mainstream pop, certainly at that stage. And they'd been through some fantastic breakfast shows and they were revamping it. They had Heather Sutty on one half of it and they were looking for a young guy, someone different, maybe someone that people hadn't heard before on the other side. And you're right, two years into my comedy journey, I've just turned 21. I think I'm doing quite well. I've won some decent open mic competitions. I'm doing the circuit and I'd done a show called Live Floor Show, a stand-up spot on that, five minutes on TV and it had gone reasonably well, BBC One Scotland. And I think I was spotted from that, asked to come in and do a demo and audition. And from then, 
I was told you've got the gig, and I had the breakfast show co-hosting for Beat One Hundred Six, which I ended up doing for a couple of years, and then that led me on this wonderful journey that I've had in radio, and a lot of that has been on breakfast shows. But yeah, at that time, no confidence, no experience. Why the hell did I get the gig? How bad were the other people that went for it? Why am I doing it? And then ultimately you learn on the job and you have to learn quickly. And now I love it and my life couldn't be without radio. I think it's a great medium. And for me, really, with a vision impairment, I rely so much on the radio now. Actually, more than television, I enjoy radio more. It's just, it's done so much for me. And listening to different things all the time, exploring. And as I say, I'm still exploring things now, even 10 years into my journey. It's it's incredible. Well, that's um, what it's all about. And with, uh, with that, that's really important you say that because it's so great to see the growth of podcasts, which gives you so much more of an option in terms of audio. And there's so many more digital radio stations and you can listen to stuff from around the world. So much more variety now. And there's more budget being thrown in to audio. And actually, audio has held up more than television has. And certainly in terms of things like traditional media, like newspapers, and that radio listening is stronger than it's ever been. The numbers are great. And it's it's something that we're always taught, and certainly what I was coached earlier on, is try and speak to that one person. Radio is mm-hmm. a very intimate, personal medium. And try and picture paint. Because we're all equals at that point. No one can see. So we're just we're just using our words and those descriptions to try and bring people along the journey with you and, and hopefully be as inclusive as possible. So that's been what I've tried to do from day one in anything that I've done in radio. It still sticks with me today. And I'm, I'm glad that it, it works. And certainly it seems to be working for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And on that subject, I interviewed Grant Stott recently for a previous podcast and we spoke about his love affair with radio and how listeners are so devoted to the the radio because of the intimacy, the feeling that we're eavesdropping on a nice cosy chat or that the host is speaking directly to us. This is particularly important to people like me who are blind or partially sighted. And like Grant Des, you have maintained your love for radio over the years, as you mentioned. But what is it about radio that inspires such devotion from the listeners and such loyalty from DJs and presenters like yourself? Well, I think you've hit on it, and I think Grant is brilliant. One of the best Mm. presenters of any kind we've ever produced in this country and someone I look up to, a great friend as well, and, uh, you know, he says it, as you have as well, it's the intimacy. It's the fact that if you do it right, that audience should feel like they know you. And probably the best to do it, I think I've ever heard, is Terry Wogan. And he created such an atmosphere in his show. He did it with maybe one or two sidekicks, but largely he was just himself in that medium. And he would draw you in with such a great voice. And he was a brilliant storyteller, great picture painter, fantastic technician at what he did. And as you say, it just brings people along with you and you feel like you know the person. If you do a good radio programme, by the end of it, the listener should know something about you they didn't know at the start and they should feel completely part of this, completely included. And when radio's done well, that's what it does. And for the sort of radio that I do, which at the moment and for quite a while has been in two fronts. So you have something like Breaking the News, which is a panel show in front of a live audience that is now entering its 10th year and is going from strength to strength. And then you've got the music-based zoo format radio for a breakfast show on Heart. And and the two mediums have such crossover, uh, the two shows have such crossover, but they are different in their own way. And I like the contrast, but at the heart of it, it's inclusive It's bringing the listener with you on the journey. It's that intimate relationship. It's always believing that there's one person listening. And I remember there was a program controller I had back in the day would often sit an extra seat around the studio and pretend that there was a person sitting there. I've heard of people having blow-up dolls in the studio with names written on them and faces painted on them to just give the presenter that idea that they're not just speaking to no one because a studio can feel like a lonely place that they are very much speaking to that one person, but that one person could be in a 100,000 different places. So just remember that. And if you do that and you open up the microphone and every time you have that in the back of your mind, 
becomes a better program, you become a better presenter and it's a better experience for the listener. Absolutely. Since I was a little girl, I've always been passionate about radio, but within the last 10 years, it's become very, very important in my life. And I owe a lot to the radio. It's, it's, it's amazing as a format. And you get your big break on television days back in 2003, when you teamed up with Stephen Mohern, Tess Daly, and a whole array of popular television presenters to front SMTV Live and latterly SMTV Gold. There is an old saying in showbiz that you never follow Sinatra, and it was always going to be a massive ask for those presenters who were to follow the UK television equivalent and in debt on SMTV. But it did provide you with a wonderful start to your television career. Can you tell us how you were first spotted and given a massive role at such a young age? Well, this is no coincidence, Claire. There's a running theme here. I was not the first choice. Um, it was again, they'd had a nationwide search, they had a lot of people, and then they were getting towards the end of that, and my star was starting to rise. I had started to appear on a couple of TV shows as a guest. Obviously, now I'm almost a year into my stint at the Beat 106 Breakfast Show, and I'm now almost three years into being a stand up. I, at this age, I'm just turned 22, and I go to London for a meeting with the exec producers. And again, nervousness, fish out of water, I don't belong, the old insecurities, all of that. But I uh, I managed to, I don't know, present myself in such a way that I had all the skills they were looking for. They wanted somebody that was naturally funny, that could work a live crowd, because remember, there was hundreds of kids in the studio that could present, that looked all right on camera, that had a decent voice. They were very happy with Ant and Deck being a regional voice, so we're obviously delighted as a Glaswegian going in there to give them something similar, but something a bit different. And obviously doing all the skits and sketches, I was happy to send myself up. I could do the funny voices and whatever was needed, you know. And at that stage, we came in with the legacy of games like Wonky Donkey on SMTV, but also we had new sketches like uh, Only Fools and Hogwash, which was, we had to use that because <laughs> we weren't allowed, weren't allowed the word Hogwarts. So it was <laughs> basically Harry... Trotter. It was all part of the Only Fools and Horses universe meets the Harry Potter world. And it was Harry Trotter and I was his big brother, Del Boy. <laughs> and it was just weird. You know, it makes sense this time next year, Harry, we're going to be millionaires. So it was weird. And then I was David Dickinson, but mm -hmm. instead of uh, Bargain Hunt, it was Garbage Hunt. And I was David Dustbin Man. So... I mean, you're, I'm now watching Dickinson's Real Deal, remember, and about 20 years ago, I was David Dickinson on the telly. Wonder if he ever saw it. We just caked on the brown and orange face makeup because he's got a hell of a tan. We put the grey wig on and the glasses, and he'll be a right Bobby Dazzler. Let's have a look in your garbage bin. <laughs> and they would bring on just people from S Club, and I'd look through their bin and just pull out these <laughs> random items. And in another sketch, I was Eminem meets Emmerdale. It was <laughs> Eminem or Dale. And I'd be sort of rapping whilst Brian Dowling and Tess Daly are trying to do a Yorkshire accent. And I just remember this amazing time. That was the last golden era of Saturday morning TV where it was on mainstream television for two hours live, getting millions of people watching. And to follow in that legacy of Ant and Deck was such an honour. And they were so supportive and still are. And I, I always look fondly upon that as one of the greatest things of my career and just such joy and brilliant memories. I will always love my time on SMTV. And I was one of them kids who watched SMTV growing hey. up. And I, <laughs> and I, I just I just remember at the time, Eminem or Dale, when you think of you on SMTV, you think of the sketch. And, uh, I've, looking still back, there, Claire. I've still got it somewhere in the house. The bandana, <laughs> the dungarees, the Eminem. Look at that time with the big gold chain. Loved it. Loved it. Uh -huh. I still do a bit of cosplay and do it in the mirror. Amazing. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved that as a child and um, it was that's always the thing that kind of stands in my mind. And you were the presenter of the programme days for the last few months of its run from March to December of 2003. And as you mentioned, Ant and Deck gave you a glowing report. Can you tell us what that was like to get such a report from the kings of television themselves? What a couple of names. For me, the best ever to do it. The absolute mm. icons. You talk about people that inspire you, people that you look up to. 
for them to have been so successful and be at the top of their game for probably thinking now about 30 years, if you look at Biker Grove onwards, and to be able to adapt to different scenarios and to change in styles and still to be as relevant and to be where they are, it's just a testament to how hard they work, how talented they are. And to get them to give me such positive words of encouragement meant a lot because I took over that show, as you say, I think I did nine, ten months of it and I was honoured to be the last ever presenter in SMTV. When I look at the legacy of who'd been there before and who was still around, I got to work with Brian Dowling, Tess Daly, Kat Daly was still there as well, Stephen Mulhern, and mm-hmm. then we had this period of SMTV Gold when we knew where we were going. It was the last few months where we did the regular live show, but we'd show inserts of classic skits and sketches. And then we had a goodbye show where Ant and Deck actually came on set and to get to present with them and to see how they did it just meant so much. And they were so kind and they were so encouraging. And I got to interview them recently for Heart Breakfast. And once again, they echoed that. They couldn't believe how quickly those 20 years had gone in. And to get that kind of endorsement from those guys and to take that opportunity, far be it from a difficult thing to follow them, it became an honour. And I, uh, I'm i so pleased to have, to have done that. Again, that was a show that I was a fan of. I would watch that as others, millions did, on Saturday mornings. And then to find yourself inside it, it was like you'd magically jumped inside the telly. Mm-hmm. And... And then you're there and you're presenting it and great times, great memories. And it it certainly is a a great way to learn about yourself and how you cope under pressure. It was live for two hours. Anything can happen. And it usually did. And it was just one of the best things I've ever done. They must be so proud of you and the journey you've been on because they obviously saw the potential in you. And it must be heartwarming for them to see how far you've come. Honestly, I don't know how I would be if I got a compliment from Ant and Deck because I absolutely love them as well. I've been a massive fan. It was SMTV that made me become an Ant and Deck fan. So I totally echo your... Um, me too. I mean, me, me too as well. I was a fan watching them. And I think that when you look at Saturday Night Takeaway and the success they, they've had with that, as we chatted about in the interview, that came from SMTV. Elements of that type of Saturday morning format they took to Saturday evenings and they still fondly remember that show because they know it was so important for them as well. It's what really launched them as TV presenters and they had a really tough time at the start of that. It didn't quite click in for them right at the beginning of SMTV. It took a good six months to a year and then when it started to work, they found out what what was really good and, and what the audience liked. It's a good example for people to have a bit of faith in yourself and be allowed to not be perfect. And sometimes you've got to fail. It's like in the comedy, sometimes you've got to die to then understand what it's like to have success. And I think um, for those guys, uh, you know, I'm so proud to have had that nice chat to be able to follow in their footsteps. And certainly there's that warmth whenever they see me again and how well that I've done. And that show has been a launch pad for me, just as it was for them probably five or six years before that. And uh, I think Saturday morning generally, as a Saturday morning TV I, uh, as much as I love cooking programmes now, it'd be nice if there was maybe uh, one or two less hours of cookery programmes on Saturday morning on the main channels and we could get some of those Saturday morning telly shows back because mm-hmm. it wasn't just the kids that watched, it was the adults. And it was a, a great thing that the family could watch together. And also it helped breed and create this new generation of TV presenters. So it was it was good for a number of reasons. And um, yeah, I'd like to see more of it there, but it was... Just an honour to be part of one of the golden ages of Saturday morning telly and one of the most iconic TV shows that probably has been in that time slot and, and maybe one of the most iconic TV shows for entertainment that we've had in the last 20, 30 years. It was incredible to think of how young you were when you were given that opportunity. And Stephen Mohern as well, working alongside yeah. the people you've worked with, is the, the confidence you must have got from that is incredible and it's definitely something that I'm proud of to have been one of the children to to witness the different eras of SMTV. I was only two when it started so I don't remember the very early years but it was around about when I was about three or four I became hooked and Ant and Deck and Cat right at the beginning oh. to you guys at the end. It's just it's just a magical time. And but I mean, you mentioned just, those names and Stephen Mulhern Again, a guy that's doing brilliantly, a guy that I've interviewed recently on Heart Breakfast talking about deal or no deal. 
and he remembers those days fondly as well. The absolute laugh and the carry on that we used to have, oh. and yeah, you know, we didn't have any auto cue in that show. Everything was off a oh. cue card, and and I just remember the the, <laughs> the two of us trying to read these cue cards, and we had this amazing ability to read the bit that the other one was meant to read, and then just to go right, yeah, well, I go, yeah, whatever, and because we'd given these color coordinated marker pens to know that when your color was coming up, you'd to read that bit. But that was the thing, that show, The Spirit of Ant, Deck and Cat, gave that format a, a really nice looseness about it. And again, it's what we spoke about with the radio, letting people in and mm. being confident and, and making that all part of the show. And when it's live TV, as long as it's not a shambles, as long as you know what you're doing, there are times when it won't go right. And they're the times where people really re love you for and they'll remember that more than anything. And, and the people that I got to work with and meet through that show... It was such a big experience for me. I loved it. I started SMTV a boy and ended it a man. It taught me so much, and I still think about it fondly to this day. Definitely. And you were talking about how parents loved it as well. My mum and my dad loved it just as much as me. Um, because, yeah. again, things work on different levels. There was a lot of jokes that maybe children, it might have went over children's heads on the show. But it's the adults true. loved it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Do you know it reminds yeah. me of panto when you've got a panto going on? Um, there's there's things for everyone, so everyone in the audience could get something from it and have a really good experience. And there might be little references that you can get away with that certain members of the audience will enjoy more than others. Saturday morning telly was exactly like that, and obviously they built a following of adults. Then they took to the Saturday nights, and then of young people that they took to Saturday nights as well. And what a career! Ant and Deck and Stephen have had since, and Kat, of course, as well, mm -hmm. is now back on this morning. So mm -hmm. it's just so nice that everybody's doing well, everybody's fit and healthy, and just a brilliant time to be around in the business and to be part of such an iconic show. And speaking of big things, Des, from 2005 to 2009, you were the presenter of the Scottish coverage of BBC Children in Need, alongside Jackie Bird and a whole host of popular Scottish stars. You've mentioned several times about how difficult it is to not let your emotions rise to the surface during a live broadcast, in particular when a harrowing story involving a young child has been recounted. But just how difficult is it to remain detached and professional during these challenging moments? And what do you do yourself personally to prevent yourself from breaking down in front of the cameras? It's a tough one. And uh, it's a good question because I'm lucky enough to host live events as well where we're rewarding some difficult stories, you know, things like Scotland's champions and Scotland's heroes that I've hosted and host, um, where you're rewarding people that have done extraordinary things. And you've mentioned, obviously, Children in Need, where I was part of that for a number of years, the Scottish coverage for five years in a row, when it was, we, we'd have a bigger coverage in Scotland at that time and they had multiple presenters. And a lot of it was live from Scotland and we would have a big audience, but you would also have these really emotive appeal films. And as a presenter, you've got to make sure that you hold it together and you get that transition between the cast of River City doing a musical and then here's where your money's going. This is why we do it. And again, you get that on Heart Breakfast when we have the big appeal moments for our charity, Globals Make Some Noise. You have to get it right. And it's all about tone and it's all about being a real person. And these appeal films, by design, they're very moving and they're real life stories. And it's it's, it's all about staying in the moment. And, it, you know, it, they give you the option of watching them beforehand uh, as a way to almost desensitise you to them so that when they go out on air on the night, you will have seen them before. So it doesn't affect you too much. And I understand that. And I certainly did that for the first couple of years. But actually... Um, in later versions of Children in Need, I would just ask roughly what it was about. And mm -hmm. for professionalism, know where it starts and ends. So I'm knowing where I'm coming in. But I like to experience it as the audience would. And it gave a more natural reaction. It's okay to let your emotions get involved on a show like that. Because it's important that you feel what the audience is feeling. And that you're not too cold and detached from it. As long as you manage to hold it together enough to give out donation details if it's the app or the appeal number um, and then for that and I love those types of shows when they're done properly and these live events as well because you're highlighting people that maybe wouldn't get a platform otherwise and hopefully 
using these platforms to raise as much as we can because charities always need our help, always have. And especially post-pandemic, a lot of charities suffered and some of them didn't survive. So if you can give a bit back and give your time to these causes, then it really does show that you can make a difference. Everyone can. Absolutely. And that's a great message. And I exactly. think that's, it's important yeah. that as a presenter that you are you're still in some way emotionally attached to it. You still have to be, you know, recognise what's happening and give across that emotion on screen. But also you have to just hold it together enough to make sure that people know there's a way in which we can help. We can stop this happening to the person in the film or to other people like them. And if if we make the awareness, sometimes it's just creating the awareness and then it's obviously creating the fundraising as well. But yeah, we live in a tough world and people have different ways of dealing with it. And at, at times you just have to face it head on and the reality of the situation some people are going through and then figure out a way in which we can help. And for those nights, it was very much about that. And then to try and keep people watching, um, you would have a celebration. You would have those entertainment moments. Yeah. So you would see, well, look, this is what it's all about. We're going to do something silly. We're going to make you laugh. We're hopefully going to make you have feel a bit of joy and and reward you um, for being part of this celebration because we are celebrating something tonight. We're celebrating the fact that your donation could save a life. And if you can't celebrate that, then then what else can you have joy about? So, yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing programmes to be a part of, especially when they, they did it in such a big way as back in the day in Scotland. And to be part of that is something that was, a, was definitely a huge honour. And again, like SMTV, I watch Children in Need every single year. And again, you were a massive part of that for them five years. Seeing you every appeal night, it was obviously a massive part of my childhood. And I remember watching it all the time. And it was just the Scottish coverage. I think the fact that there was regional coverage, we obviously have our own national identity. And it was just so good from a Scottish perspective to put that across so it was definitely again a golden age of television and we're glad that we lived through that um oh, was... thank you and it was great to be part of it and to hear those kind words but yeah for all of us that it was a different time budgets were different and you're right we were able to do a much more regional output and for scotland it's it's a nation if I, you know it's a country um so to be able to speak to the people of scotland and say look the, the, these are uh, appeals that directly appeal to you and this is fundraising that if you raise it here it's going to stay here and yeah it was it was good to feel that you were part of something like that across Scotland and it was very important for us and it was just a great thing to be a part of. And on the subject of entertaining moments Des, Children in Need has raised phenomenal sums of money over the past four decades and the Scottish coverage has provided us with some very unforgettable moments. My own personal highlight was when Runrig performed Loch Lomond on the eve of the ill-fated game that Scotland played against Italy in November 2007 at Hampden Park. But do you have any personal highlights over the five years that you presented the programme? Yeah, I mean, that certainly is, is one of them. I remember being at the bottom of a stunt bike that I think it was Danny McCaskill and I was live and I didn't know that when I screamed I would make that noise and it was <laughs> unbelievable. He was bouncing around me with his wheel and then for his final stunt he came off, I think, in Pacific Key. I was in the corridor but I think he came off of the top of a flight of stairs. I honestly thought, this is it. This is I'm having my Alan Partridge moment. There's going to be a murder live <laughs> on the telly. This time I'm the victim. And I, I just remember that. I remember that moment of just thinking, wow, this is my job. If if that's not worth a couple of quid, what is? So mm -hmm. that was that was definitely a, a, a big one in terms of a stunt, a bit of entertainment, something to hook people in. But you're right, it was it was often just the people turning up to the studios in their pajamas that had been walking all day. It was uh, kids' choirs, always with some young children in around and seeing those sing, especially from the local primary schools, those moments. And then you mentioned one about Runrig when they were performing, and I know Susan Boyle's done it as well. Anything that's emotive and that pulls on the heartstrings, it does so for a good reason. So those are the ones that stand out, but especially anything where the kids got involved, because that was a real kids' charity, and anything where someone with a bike wheel nearly took my head off. <laughs> is... <laughs> Just shows you the contrast of that night, and you can go from one extreme to the other, all with the purpose of 
hopefully helping those that really need it. And that's why it was so special. Definitely. And the run rig performance, I watched that all the time. I could just feel the adrenaline in the studio. I could not imagine being there because I, I think I would just have went absolutely ballistic. Yeah, I um, think I was putting a kilt that night. That, that's right, um, yeah. Certainly, mm. certainly was not my kilt and <laughs> it was certainly made for a much taller man. So I basically, I had a lovely, I don't know, I looked like an upside down lamp. <laughs> But it was uh, it was very Scottish, and it was the only bit of tartan they could find. I think it was meant for somebody that was six foot seven, but had to get involved. And the emotion of it, and speaking to the squad, and speaking to Alec McLeish right before it, and being part of a big moment for the country. And it's typical Scotland, we're full of hope, and then ultimately glorious failure. But at that time, it was all about the hope. It was all about the optimism, and that's what makes Scotland special. And we have that again. We're going to have that heading into the Euros once more. So I'm all for those moments. Any time where Scotland as a nation is brought together and people forget about any divisions that they have, it's uh, it's always special. And to have been right at the centre of that for that one moment, then uh, that was pretty special. In 2007, the Inverclyde Schools Junior Choir actually performed the Any Dream Will Do. They were in the studio performing that. And wow. uh, that was the choir that I ended up joining. So many of my friends were actually involved in that choir. Um, Amazing. Everything happened that night. And I, I remember watching it and being really jealous because I'd just joined the choir the year before and I was in, still in training choir. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's so incredible. So many different connections and so many memories of that time, as you say. Uh -huh. And we love when we got the choirs in because it just made it so much more real, so much more relevant, and it was it was just incredible. Great time to mm. to be around and to be part of that. And, um, yeah, that was certainly a moment where I, was, I felt like I was really at the centre of everything and just enjoyed every minute. Absolutely. And London played host to the Olympic Games back in 2012 days. You were given the honour of carrying the Olympic torch through the streets of Glasgow. And just two years later, in 2014, when the Commonwealth Games came to Scotland, you were the presenter of the closing ceremony at Hampden Park in Glasgow, alongside other Scottish celebrities. Can you tell us how these opportunities arose for you? But more importantly, how big a laxative is it to broadcast live to a billion people worldwide? <laughs> oh, wow. This is uh, two elements of me getting in touch with sport, despite having very little sporting ability. I'm a huge fan of sport, but this was just incredible. The Olympic torch, first of all, was a great moment. Thousands of people in my hometown of Glasgow, and James McAvoy is handing me the torch. And it just, it stands out for me. I ended up becoming a story that I told in my stand-up because it was just amazing. The world watching, I remember the buzz and the hype ahead of that. It was the biggest Olympics that had ever been held and the torch comes to Glasgow. And I can tell you, I still have the torch. I've got it. Whether I was meant to take it or not, it's in my house. And <laughs> it, it's certainly mine. And it's still got the scorch marks from where it was lit. So you can tell that it's been used. And it was just incredible. And I remember feeling really emotional that day. And uh, a weird part of my stand-up story, but true, my dad said that he wouldn't be able to get there that day because he couldn't get the car anywhere near the city centre. And then I'm doing my leg of the journey, having just taken the flame from James McAvoy, running into George Square, and my dad jumped out in the street in front of me. And he was, these clapper boards, I don't know where he got them from. And I was like, oh my, that's a surprise and I'm probably going to cry. So... To be part of that and that national fervour and to build up to that big event, oh, God, it felt great. I felt like a sports person for the first time in my life. And then fast forward two years, London did, did such a great event. How was Glasgow going to do? This is my hometown. It's 2014. And I was given, first of all, the honour of hosting the pre-show, which started at 14 minutes past eight at night. So 2014 is when I walked on stage, obviously, very cleverly constructed because we're talking about the year 2014 and I did the pre-show to the live audience at Celtic Park it was and thought, I mean you're talking I'm playing Celtic Park there's 60,000 people and then many more watching at home and I, I could tell that we were making a lot of noise in the arena because it was referenced by some of the presenters and people at home were going the thing's already started why are we not seeing it 
So they had to cut to the coverage a few times to show this is just a pre-show. You can get this in the red button. And uh, and it was it was magical. And that was what kicked it off. The sun was shining. It was a fantastic games. And it really was the birth of that phrase, people make Glasgow. But while I was preparing for that, uh, doing the warm-up, the pre-show for the opening ceremony, they took me into a room, the organisers, the international broadcasting team, and they obviously liked me. They thought I was good, and they kept making these compliments about, like, you really sum up modern Scotland. You're like a real beacon of positivity. You you sum up what we think Glasgow should be about. Um, can we show you our plans for the closing ceremony? And I was like, yeah, I'm in the office anyway. I might as well look at this. And they'd done this storyboard, and they had Hamden Park with 50,000 people. They had Kylie. They had Lulu. They had a few random Scotty dogs. They had Usain Bolt. They had Tom Daly. They had all these tents. And I said, what's the vibe? They went, oh, we're going for a music festival feel, celebration. Because the closing ceremony, believe it or not, usually gets even more viewers than the opening. So we reckon about a billion at least to watch this. I thought, wow, that's exciting. And I thought they were going to ask me to do the pre-show again. And they said, they showed me more and more of the storyboards. And there was a guy in the middle holding a microphone that looked a bit like me as a cartoon. And I got to about the fourth or fifth storyboard where I saw myself and I went, what is it you want me to do here? And they said, we want you to host it. I said, what, the pre-show? They went, no, 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 no. The main show. The show, is it often when they have these shows, they usually either have multiple people hosting or nobody hosting. It's just a series of things that happen and the commentators do the voiceover. But they were really keen to do it as a celebration of Scotland's culture and music and festival. And had been a, at that time, it hadn't happened, but they believed it was going to be a great games. So they put me hosting it myself, front and centre, and it's the most amazing thing I've ever done. It outranks everything else. A billion people, and just feeling at the centre of it, feeling so proud to be Glaswegian, so proud to, so proud to be Scottish. I'm for the south side of Glasgow, originally the Gorbals, not that far really from Hamden and the world scale of things. Mm. And to be there as the sole host of the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games in my home city to uh, approximate one billion people watching. Don't know how I can top that. It was it was incredible. Like SMTV, no auto queue. Um, I'm just dealing off handwritten cue cards, but I didn't want to be looking at cards, so I'd memorise it and then just chuck them. And I just felt so, so amazing at that time just to be part of it in any way and to celebrate a fantastic time for Scotland. I felt like such a lucky boy that day. On a personal level, that was one of the darkest times of my life because of what happened to me. But the, the Commonwealth Games really, it was amazing escapism, really. And it made you feel so patriotic, so proud of the fact that that Glasgow did such an amazing job. And I remember um, the build-up to it, watching a lot of Scottish things, listening to a lot of Scottish music, just trying to get mm. myself in the mood. And it was just it was just wonderful. And the closing ceremony in particular as well was just, again, quite emotional, quite emotional yeah. watching it. But Glasgow definitely did everybody proud. Glasgow did everyone proud. And there was a, an amazing moment at the end, queuing in Dougie McLean for Caledonia. And you can hear my voice breaking. And that was oh. that was where I, I was a you know a more mature presenter at that time. And I was I felt all right to let the emotion come in as and when it needed to. And it's inspiring to hear your story, which echoes that exact time of my life and how maybe for a couple of weeks that was a bit of escapism where you could be part of the celebration and, and forget about obviously something that was happening in your own life. And that's what we're always aware of, comedians, presenters, radio, television, whatever we do when you perform. You just don't know how you're going to touch someone's life and at what stage of their life you'll come across them at and you could just make a difference to that one person you've never met. And that's the special thing about doing what we do. Absolutely. Now, Des, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, speaking of inspiring people, you've shared with us, TV viewers and radio listeners, some of your most deep-rooted fears and phobias, and we've watched and listened as you sought to conquer them. The idea started with the big triathlon for sport relief back in 2018, where we saw you learn how to ride a bike and drive a car for the first time, as well as trying to conquer one of your biggest fears of water and learn how to swim. 
And the programme Des does it do, we see you address another one of your biggest fears of heights, among other things. You took part in Des's big drop, where you abseiled 165 feet in the air down the fourth rail bridge in aid of Global's Make Some Noise annual charity campaign, as well as the Scottish amputee charity Finding Your Feet. Do you feel as if you've exercised that ghost completely now of having a fear of heights, or is this just part of an even bigger process that you have to overcome? Oh, wow, what a process. I mean, I, I think I'm still ongoing. Uh, but yeah, that was a huge, huge moment for me. And it's so great at this stage of my life. I'm still hitting these big moments and hopefully helping others. And you're right, genuine fears there. So the triathlon starts with me trying to drive a car, which I can now do, trying to ride a bike. Chris Hoy teaching me how to ride a bike. I mean, how amazing is that? And then doing an outdoor swim on the day one of the Beast of the East, which is one of the worst storms that have ever hit, and the terror and fear with that. I still have that fear of swimming in water. That's very real, and hopefully I will deal with that at some point. But with Des's big drop, which we did on Heart Breakfast, as you say, I was challenged live on air uh, for Global's Make Some Noise, our big charity, by Finding Your Feet, that wonderful amputee charity. I just had to do it. And they teamed me up with an amazing therapist that put a VR, virtual reality headset on me and had me up at the top of these New York skyscrapers and looking out and walking across these ledges. And that intense process, seven or eight of those sessions, got me ready for eventually, as you say, going off the fourth bridge on a rope, abseiling, going over the side, 165 foot in the air. That would never have been me. I've had that trauma from childhood, growing up in the high flats and the, the scheme and the gorbals, and that is a trauma that stuck with me. So to overcome that was a big example, hopefully, to say, if you face your fears head, head on and deal with them properly, you can get there. And to be able to do that in the name of some amazing charities and raise as much as we did just made it such a wonderful experience. And those programmes you talk about, the triathlon for sport relief, or Des doesn't do as well. All of these things just showed me partly, maybe I just never grew up and all these things that I hadn't done in my life, but actually they turned into a big advantage. And I know they've inspired others to take up new skills and overcome phobias. So if that's the takeaway from that and you enjoyed the programme, then absolutely brilliant. And in the process, we raised a lot for charity as well. So yeah, delighted to be part of all of those things. And you talk about the power of radio earlier on. Personally, for me, listening to that, it was so, so powerful. And there was a, a couple of points, I actually had a lump in my throat. See, especially when you had the virtual reality headset, that felt so real. You could actually feel the nervousness from you. And how candid you were about something so tra challenging in your life. It takes a lot to do that, and I have to give you huge kudos for that. That couldn't have been easy for you, and you've inspired a lot of people from doing that, and it's testament to yourself and how far you've come. And oh. I just I love the journey that you were on, just the fact that you embraced it and you, you faced it head on, but also as inspiring others. And when you actually did it, oh hey. my goodness. I was, yeah. I was honestly, I said to my mum and my dad, see if I, you hear me screaming in the other room. I was just nah. I was so rooting <laughs> for you and I was so happy for you at the end. Oh, thank you for saying it. that. Well, that, that's what we're talking about earlier on. It's letting that emotion come in and trying to convey it to others. And I had so, so, so many messages from people with a fear of heights saying, well done, big man, and hopefully I'll give it a go. And what's the number of that therapist? I want to call her right now. And um, it was true. I was basically, I was a man on the edge. And for the first time, I learned to be brave enough to step over the edge. And a great moment. And I'm so glad it came across so well on the radio. Credit to the team at Heart and to the team at Globals Make Some Noise and to everyone involved with that. And we raised so much. And that's really what it's all about. Absolutely. And when you hear other stories as well about people who took part with you, it's the fearless oh. personalities of a lot of these people. I mean, that just blew me away as well. Some of the details was pretty hard to hear, but just to get a bit of context to it and to, to realise the magnitude of what these people were achieving, it's unbelievable, really. Well, so, that's so nice of you to say that. And and there it is. It's, a, it's the Heart Breakfast Show. It's a music radio programme across Scotland. 
It's part of the biggest radio network um, in the UK, Western Europe. And when you're part of that and you've got this remit to entertain and be all about the feel good and play just brilliant songs, that's just wonderful. What a gift it is. And then when you can pivot and have these moments, like, for example, Globals Make Some Noise Day, when you can actually talk about something more emotive and more serious and touch people in a different way, it really is just such an honour to be in that hot seat presenting that show. And I just think it's the best job. And I'm, I'm such a lucky guy to be able to do it every day. Absolutely. And you could actually feel the support from your whole team, from Jennifer, mm. from Danny as well, and from all the other the newsreaders, the producers. You could just feel that everybody was there with you and wanting you to do well, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. So, oh, you know, it's, thank it's you. I'll pass that on to them. I know that'll mean a lot. And for the listeners as well, I felt like I wasn't doing it alone. Everyone was helping me and it was, oh. it was just incredible. Des Doesn't Do is a programme in which you take a closer look at popular pastimes and parts of our culture that have just left you out on the island, so to speak. With some very well-known friends, you take a fresh look at parenting, cooking, singing, tattoos, dogs, horror, thrills, the outdoors and winter sports, and you attempt to understand why they hold such a strong appeal for many people in society, but not you. Having watched you on television and having seen your anxiety and sometimes pain, I can totally empathise with you. Without giving the game away, Des, because all the episodes of Des Doesn't Do are well worth watching, were there any popular pastimes that you took part in during the show that you've been won over by? But more importantly, what ones are you glad to see the back of? (laughs) I think camping with Grado. Uh, did require a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, help to try and unpack that afterwards, because um, it was halfway through it. He turned around to me and said, "Des, they brought me on as a camping expert." I'm not going to lie, I hate camping, mate. <laughs> See, I just thought it'd be a laugh to do this, and we were doing all this, but these bizarre activities outside, and um, it was. I don't know, it was a really nice day, but the, the place they got for us to pitch that tent was freezing and it was wet and he did a couple of cans and the snoring, the farting, it was... It, <laughs> <laughs> but I never, I've never laughed so much. So what I say is I'd love to, as we have done, spend a lot of time together, maybe just not in the freezing cold in a tent. So mm-hmm. I've not quite come round to the world of camping. Obviously, um, I got a tattoo this is the weird thing. I went to a tattoo artist in Paisley with Judy Murray. It's so weird saying this stuff out loud because this actually happened and it was filmed. And I now have that mark on my right leg and it's the mark of my, my own heartbeat that the tattoo artist put on. And it was it was so encouraging to have Judy there because I've got to know her so well over the years and worked with her a lot on stage And she's now a great pal. And the absolute lack of sympathy that she had, it was a case of just get on with it. Just let the guy do his tattoo. It's only a wee one. Just hurry up. And you can see why that level of support has uh, brought two of the greatest tennis stars into the world. So I felt like an honorary Murray that day. But yeah, everyone had its own story. Everyone had its own experience. And some of them it was... A case of Des would do this again, and some I'm not so sure. Um, cooking, there was an episode on cooking with Kirsty Walk that was amazing, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'd happily do more cooking, which I have, but I'm not sure about hosting a dinner party. Mm-hmm. I felt that was the, that was the pressure. It was the pressure of of being a host and people watching you cook, and it was an open plan kitchen and getting everything out there on time. So yeah, there was there, there was a lot, and everyone was an experience. The one about extreme sports was really difficult because we were doing that one and it was it was during COVID or post-COVID. So I was on a ski slope and the instructor was like, this is so unnatural to me because I would never let an absolute beginner get in a ski slope and I couldn't hold on to them. But it's COVID and I've got to keep two metres away from you. So <laughs> all the, it was basically... It was a compilation of me falling off a hill. I looked like sort of a Mr. Blobby with a ski mask. (laughs) And I was like, this is funny, but I can't ski. So all of those extreme sports, especially skiing or skating, I can't do that. I did a day of skating. They never even kept it in the edit. 
And I, I, I thought I'd done well at that one. I thought I'd done well at it. And they're like, nah, it was rubbish. So, yeah, everyone was a learning experience. They were all entertaining. The people that I dealt with along the road, whether it be the celebs or the different contributors, were just awesome. And it was a great way to show off Scotland and its people. So, yeah, we ended up doing three triathlon activities in 10 days doesn't do this. They were all, all fantastic. I learned a lot and it was a pretty entertaining thrill ride along the way. And out of it, yeah, I can, I can drive a car and eventually after a bit of therapy, I can now kind of deal with heights. So, ah, you know what, it wasn't all bad. Take the positives out of it. That's the main thing. Definitely. Mm, absolutely. And you're currently in the midst days of doing your 26th series of Breaking the News, the hilarious topical comedy panel show on BBC Radio Scotland, which you have fronted since the pilot episode back in 2015. As someone who's registered blind days, I absolutely love the radio, as I mentioned before, and was in on the ground running with Breaking the News. It's fast paced, hilariously funny, and also showcases some very well established and emerging comedians from Scotland and beyond. Setting aside any false modesty days, what do you think has been the key to the show's success and longevity? I think there was just such a gap in the market for it. After 2014, there'd been a lot of political debate around Scotland, obviously, and with the showcase of the 2014 Commonwealth Games. But it felt like whenever the referendum was happening, you were deferring to Mock the Week and Have I Got News For You. Fine programmes, but they were UK-wide panel shows often, pretty much always, not featuring any Scots talking about Scotland. And I think for us, we felt we were getting so much serious political programming talking about the news in Scotland that we needed something to showcase what we do best, which is be funny, witty and entertaining. And therein, Breaking the News came about. And I did the pilot. And straight away, I knew we've got something here. And the format came together pretty quickly and only minimal tweaks in the first year. And it's pretty much stayed as it is. And it's just such a laugh. The panellists are brilliant. It's so well produced as well. And the audiences are so loyal and they're fantastic. The show is bigger now than it ever has been nine years and 26 series later. And I sometimes feel like I've got the best seat in the house. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there with this brilliant audience, these great producers and these four wonderful panellists who have been brilliantly funny about stuff that's happened over the last seven days. And it feel it feels like it came in and it filled a hole that Scotland needed. And it's um, it's still doing it pretty well. And um, it, it's been brilliant for bringing through emerging talent and giving the experience in the panel shows so that then when they get other opportunities, say if they do get I Have I Got News For You or something like that, the experience of doing maybe four or five breaking the news is same if they get a news quiz in Radio 4. They feel like, actually, that prep of doing our show, and we're very well structured and organised and, and how we work with the panellists, that's definitely benefited them. And they usually, in fact, always come and thank us for the opportunity and mm -hmm. for the leg up that it's given them for them when they do other panel shows. So, mm -hmm. so to do that, to bring through new talent, to give people a laugh in what's otherwise a serious world, and to give a comedy satirical slant into the news, it feels like the right thing that came along at the right time for Scotland. And the fact that it's still running, the fact that it's bigger than ever now, and we get it on TV as well as radio, is something that I'm over the moon to be part of. And it's one of the best things that I've done in my career. I love it. And we absolutely love it as well. It's one of our favourite comedy topical panel shows and oh. listen to it all the time and it's just it's fantastic and some of the comedians on it are just phenomenal and now um, Des, if I like a good stand-up comedian, a sketch comedy, topical panel show or sitcom, I will go out and buy the DVDs and I will play them until they're worn out. Mm. Many of the writers and participants I feel on topical panel shows like Breaking the News or Have I Got News For You or topical sitcoms like Drop the Dead Donkey have to work so much hard to get their content as they rely heavily on current events to drive their content. And they also can't write too much material weeks or months in advance. They could also lose out on having the same legacy as, say, Frasier or Faulty Towers that don't stick to a specific time period. Is that the case? Or have Boris Johnson, Donald Trump and co provided you with so much content that the shows write themselves? <laughs> uh, I wish the shows wrote themselves. The issue with 
things like Brexit that stayed in the news for ages with Trump and Johnson is coming up with new material on the same topics and getting there first and getting there before the other shows and before the talk shows and the panel shows. So I think it makes it more of a challenge. Our writers are fantastic. Um, and sometimes the stuff that we come up with as well that makes it into the show, it knocks it out of the park. And it, it's it's just a testament to everyone. The writers are brilliant and that wonderful. And that's bringing through some great writing talent that have then gone on elsewhere. When you write about the legacy, it feels like topical material, much harder to do, but it's harder to look back on, if you know what I mean. I can look back on an old episode of Seinfeld, but a break in the news from six years ago would give you a fantastic snapshot of what was going on in the world at that time. But it is, uh, it's harder to edit again, although you do get Have I Got Old News For You that's shown on various channels on cable and satellite. But yeah, I think it's a testament to the writers. They're fantastic. They get the brief. And many of them come up to me and say, <laughs> I have your voice in my head, Des. And it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird feeling. It's like you live inside me because I get your rhythm your tone, your delivery, so that then informs how I write. So that that's brilliant that they're even thinking that way, and I really apologise for having my dulcet tones inside their brain. And <laughs> and also the amount of prep that you get from the comedians that are on it as well, they give mm-hmm. such an energy to it. it. It just it just works. There's a formula that works. We've been nominated so many times for the Celtic Media Awards. We've won Scottish Comedy Awards, been nominated for UK Comedy Awards as well. So it works really well for Scotland and beyond. And the recognition we get is fantastic. And I think there was a story that appeared in the paper last year where it saved someone's life. A Mm -hmm. guy, an expat, I think in America, was listening to Breaking the News and Raymond Mern's voice, one of our great panellists, Raymond Mern's voice came on and the guy was being attacked by a bear at the time. And Mern's came on with one of his legendary rants and his voice is so booming that it, stirred the bear, scared him off and saved the guy's life. I'm like, what is happening? And, and Jay Lafferty, another one of our great panellists, did a fantastic description of Brexit and breaking the news. That made it to the front of the New York Times. Wow. Um, and I know the show's been featured in Piers Morgan's column at times in the past as well. So it has cut through. A lot of people within the industry know it. It's been such a hit in Scotland and further afield and continues to be so, and we're so, so proud of that show. And as the host, my job is just a case of trying to tune up the band and conduct them, knowing when to step in and when to step back. And once you get that nailed, the magic formula that works for Breaking the News just keeps on going, and the show just keeps on producing amazing episodes and series, even funnier than the last one. That's why I love it. Absolutely. And what I love in particular about Breaking the News is how it embraces diversity and inclusion with the many guests that appear on the show, some of whom have protected characteristics, such as Ashley Story, who's autism spectrum disorder, Jamie McDonald, who's registered blind, Val McDermott and Susan McCabe, who are both gay, black and Asian guests like Athena Cabueno, Sanjeev Foley, Rhea Lina and Ahir Shah, among others. How important do you think it has been to the success of breaking the news, that you have sought out the outlook, the experiences and the humour of the comedians and participants of different diverse backgrounds. Well done for noticing that, Claire, because that's been happening since day one and we've always done it and not made a thing about it. We've just brought people on. You'll notice that the panels are always um, 50-50, male and female. When we came around in 2015, uh, the women were still seen as token gestures in some panel mm-hmm. shows and talked about that and being uncomfortable in that environment. So we didn't make it a thing. It was just always from day one, female, uh, two female panellists, two male panellists. It is what it is. And 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 they're all there not from tokenism. Everybody you mention is there not to tick a box. They're there because they're funny. They're there on merit. And it's a case of just widening your scope and looking at what is around you, maybe beyond the traditional rota of people that were on panel shows. And by the way, all of those talented people still get on. Even if you're not part of any of those groups, you're still getting on the show. But also mm-hmm. now that you are part of those groups, you're also welcome in the show. And everybody's done a great job and everybody's on there because they've got something to offer, a great voice, and that they're funny about it. And we've just done that as a matter of fact kind of way, behind the scenes in production and in writing. You know, half of our lead writers are female as well. So all of these things are are just things that have happened. 
and we've not sought to make a big deal out of it, uh, make a big deal of it, because it's just reflective of the wider society and opening it up for for everyone. And um, you know, even somebody you mentioned, like Jamie McDonald, talking about being a blind comedian on our show, and he always has us use that as part of his introduction. And then to see him get on Have I Get News for You was just wonderful. And mm-hmm. and to be there maybe as the first platform for some of these groups and certainly for some of the individuals is just great. But they're there because they're good. They're there because they're funny and they work within the show. And it's great for us because it means we can extend our casting to pretty much everyone. If you want to do it, you're up for it and you're good enough, then you'll get on breaking the news and the success of the show speaks for itself. It doesn't matter what issues you have or what background you come from, as long as you're funny. That's the main thing, as long as you're talented. 100%. 100%. And, if you get if you get comedy, you get talent, and you want to write some topical stuff, then you'll do for us. We'll have you. No bother. Absolutely. And in 2023, Des, during the World Snooker Championships at the Crucible, you presented a podcast about all things snooker alongside fellow comedian and breaking the news panelist Amy Matthews. I found snooker to be very informative, interesting, of course, very funny. Are you going to be recording a new series of snooker this year? I wish we were. Unfortunately, we're not. Budget constraints mean we can't do it, which I'm heartbroken about. I'd love to have done more snookered. It doesn't mean that it's gone forever. Um, it may come back, and certainly my involvement in snooker isn't gone because it is a lifelong passion from when I was a wee boy, and I loved the the whole business of snooker. I love the sound of the game. I love the experience of being there. I love the fact I go to the Crucible every year and watch the World Championships in the fine city of Sheffield. And when you're in that, the tension, you can't even open a bag of sweets. You can't mm. lean the wrong way because you're making too much noise. But it's <laughs> great. It's lovely. You're on a knife edge the whole time. And it was such a welcoming sport. And that podcast did great business. Over a quarter of a million streams from a brand new podcast that had come from nowhere. We ran 10 episodes during the World Championships of 2023 with so many big guests, starting off with my hero, seven-time world champion, Stephen Hendry, my other hero of broadcasting, Hazel Irvin. Mm-hmm. And then, it, you know, it ran, it it did so well, and the snooker fraternity, the snooker world, really embraced us, and we ended up getting nominated for Best Sports Podcast at the UK Podcast Awards. So to do all of that from an idea that I'd had a couple of years before, I wanted a fan podcast for snooker because one didn't exist. Some mm-hmm. really fine podcasts existed, but they were usually pundits, players, journalists. And I wanted one that embraced that world, but also had fans. And myself and Amy Matthews bonded backstage at gigs talking about snooker. And then we took that genuine relationship and made it into something pretty remarkable. And I am still a massive, mega super fan of snooker. And uh, I love everyone that I've met within that world. And hopefully I will do more within the world of snooker. And at some point, snooker may well be back. Absolutely. And it's great that you obviously have that feeling for it as well and that you understand why things happened the way they did. And you currently host a breakfast show alongside Jennifer Rea on Heart Scotland. And in 2019, Des, you and Jennifer started working together on the Heart Drive Time show and did so for four years until 2023 when you took over the breakfast show. Once again, it's fast moving up tempo and is on five days a week from 6.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning. Where do you get your energy from? <laughs> I think, I don't know, I, I'm saying it's my family. My mum and dad were always hard workers. My dad, uh, they're both still with us. My dad was a brickie, so he was up at that time in the morning. So it's same energy, different job. And and I just try and apply that work ethic to it. And, and I'm a real morning person. I, I love the time slot. I love getting up and in about it. Breakfast show is the prime time in radio. It's the show that people desire. It's where all the big personalities are. It's the most competitive marketplace, but I love it. And I've done it at various points in my career. I did the Capital Breakfast Show for over 10 years. I've done Beat 106 Breakfast Show for two and a half years. And now we're almost exactly a year into the Heart Breakfast Show every mm-hmm. day live across Scotland. Love working with the team there. Jennifer's great. 
We have a, a great chemistry and partnership. And we developed that. We'd known each other before and hosted a couple of events. But as you say, it was really in 2019, the Heart Drive Time Show. And doing that, especially during and after the pandemic, we had no idea how big that would get. And being on it, drive time was actually, at that time period, the most important slot of the day. Because A, people were getting up later and staying at home. But B, the press briefings, the daily briefings, if you remember those, would happen late afternoons. They would happen during our show. Mm. So you were on air dealing with all that breaking news as it happened and keeping people going with information and entertainment at an important time. And then we kept delivering great numbers in our Rage Our Listening figures. And eventually they decided to take a revamp on heart in Scotland. And we got the switch from drive time to breakfast. And one year in, I'm loving it. And I've been able to do mm -hmm. so many amazing things already. And just such an exciting future ahead in that show. It's It feels like, for me, it was like coming home, doing a breakfast show. And heart is just a brand that I, it, it's just me. It's just perfect for me. And that time slot is ideal. So I'm loving it. And it's just the perfect way to start the day and I'm glad you're enjoying it as well. What a phenomenal station it is and again regional content, the importance of regional content, having that voice, having that Scottish accent, you know, yeah. providing the content and the material. I think it's just, it's wonderful. It's just a positive station and that's what you need to get you through the day and everything. So Absolutely. That's what we're all about. We we always say the phrase, turn up the feel good, and mm -hmm. we live and breathe that. We're all about the feel good. We're trying to find those positive stories. And from breakfast show through to when the drive home is done, we're live from Scotland, and we go to some fantastic programming from the network overnight. And on every show, you'll hear great energy when it comes to the playlist and all the production we use, and also mm -hmm. in terms of the tone and the content by the presenters. It's all about just what I'm about, which is hopefully having a bit of joy within you and spreading it amongst others as well. And, you know, the feel good is not just a statement, it's it's our way of life. And we love what we do in heart and we've been so well received. And the more Scottish shows we've done, the more well received we are in Scotland. So very much proud to be part of it and long may it continue. Phenomenal, brilliant. And I almost choked in my Tati Scondes. I was laughing so hard when Jennifer suggested that because you're faced up to your fear of heights head on, that the next logical step in your journey would be to jump out of an aeroplane. Behave what yourself. What prospects of that happen anytime mm -hmm. soon? No, my, this is, but don't you be saying things like that. You're putting ideas, you're encouraging her. This, I'm going to, honestly, I'm, I'm regretting doing this podcast. This was a mistake. Oh my God. <laughs> God, listen, here's the thing. Jennifer took flying lessons at the end of that year and some bright spark has said, oh, here's an idea. Why doesn't Jennifer fly the plane and Des jumps out of it? I'm like, wait a minute, what? So I'm not even in a proper plane with a qualified pilot. Oh, and by the way, I'm just jumping now. I don't even have a rope. Oh, my God. So here's the thing. I know that this suggestion is going to come back again. And I know that come... October, when Globals Make Some Noise happens again, someone's going to have the bright idea, it's probably going to be your fault, Claire, that they're going to decide, oh, this is what Des needs to do. Well, honestly, I'm keeping quiet. I'm saying nothing. I feel like we'll just let it be and see what happens. And then if I'm alive at the end of it, hopefully, whatever I end up doing, it raises a lot of money and I'm not too traumatised. But this, don't don't you be saying this because this is starting to get a bit of momentum now. This <laughs> this the, <laughs> this big, you know, we've done the we've done Des's drop. I'm hearing Des's dive is is coming into production <laughs> as well. So listen, I'm just killing this idea before it starts. Never gonna happen. This is the last we'll ever speak of this again. Thank <laughs> you. <very much. laughs> Oh, oh, honestly, too many people are saying it already. We're, we're, oh. we're way off. We're about six months before it's happening. I'm still getting people already saying, oh, I've what you're doing this year. Do you want me to go? Do you know what you could do? You could jump out of a... I, I, don't, don't even finish that. Don't even finish it. No. Um. So we'll see what happens. We will, yeah. We're on the journey. <laughs> we don't know what it's going to be, but no doubt I'll be doing something weird and wonderful for charity this year. So watch this space. And you're game for it, which is brilliant. And I'll finally, Des, 
Yeah. And finally, Des, could we be seeing a Des Clark special anytime soon where you borrow Cat Shearer's kids and you and your wee Doug Patch go camping in a creepy forest and spend the night singing and cooking and bungee jumping from the tallest trees <laughs> and swimming in the Eunice locks? I would really love to watch that programme. Do you know who'd love that? Cat Shearer. See if you get rid of her kids and me babysitting them for nothing. She'd be up for that. I'm telling you. She said that to me at the time. She said, let's uh, let's workshop this. She can give us every Friday and Saturday off. So I hope so. It'd be lovely to do an amalgamation of all the things and put into practice what I've learned. So you never know. It might happen. That might come back in some form or another. I'd love to do that. Um, and yeah, other than that, I'd love to just keep doing what I'm doing. I, I, I pop up at random places. I, I'm now the voice of Jeopardy, doing game show on ITV, hosted by oh, Stephen amazing. Fry. Yeah, I, I, I've been on that. My dulcet tones have featured in daytime ITV. I'm doing a lot of great VTs with the one show and with Morning Live, where I'm mm -hmm. finding out different things that are happening, usually Scottish-based stories, and it's nice to give a, a network opportunity to some amazing things. The most recent one was me trying to learn the bagpipes, and I thought, wow, this would have been a great episode for Des Doesn't Do. Can you imagine <laughs> me trying to take part in the, the Edinburgh military tattoo or something? Oh, my God. So, yeah, all of these great things are happening. Heart Breakfast, Breaking the News, and all the event hosting and the charity stuff, all that goes on. And I want to do more stand-up. If there was one resolution you mentioned special, there's never been a Des Clark comedy special. So at some point, I would love to do a full, really nice room, maybe a theatre somewhere in Glasgow, and do a Des Clark comedy special. And then maybe I could, at the very least, talk about all these things that I've done. And uh, you know what? It's part of what we've been talking about throughout this whole podcast. If you can do something that helps yourself and maybe helps others and brings a bit of entertainment and light in a world that can sometimes be pretty dark, then... For me, that feels like I'm doing my job. And this job, remember, at one point was just a passion. And now it's turned into work. But you know what? The more I do it, the more I love it and the more I want to keep doing it. So it's a positive message, I think, to end on. And hopefully mm -hmm. that special will be somewhere on a stage at some time soon. Absolutely. And again, as you say, that's the whole message of it is if you've got a passion for something, then just pursue it really and for for me really just hearing your story and everything you're talking about Grant earlier on and how he's the best at what he does I would say yourself as well that honesty that relatability authenticity I just think you're incredible and so wow. inspirational to me as well just um well and it's, wow. it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today and thank you so much for being my guest on Clara in Conversation well, that is a pleasure, and Claire, you're an inspiration to me and many others, and thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And Des can be heard every Friday afternoon at half past one on Breaking the News, and it's repeated at half past 11 every Saturday morning. But don't worry, if you miss an episode, you can always catch it on BBC Sounds. And he can also be heard waking in up Scotland every morning, as we mentioned earlier on, along alongside Jennifer Reeck on the Heart Breakfast Show from 6.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning every Monday to Friday. And he's also a regular on the stand-up circuit. And honestly, you need to go and see a Des Clark show if you haven't. It's absolutely brilliant. Des, once again, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you very much, Claire. Absolute pleasure.